what a statement. Make room. And that's why you're here, to make room for God to do something. But man, to do whatever he wants. Did you, did you sing that? Because I'm going to like, I don't know, test that today. Hey, if you're watching online, because you didn't want to lose that hour of sleep. I'm just kidding. I love you. Good to see you guys. I'm just kidding. Uh, it also snowed, which is like, this is literally like a pastor's worst nightmare. You have, you already lost the hour of sleep. Oh, let's snow on top of that. But you guys are still here, so... Uh, Before we get going, on your way out, you're going to get one of these. This is uh, our Easter invite, so Easter is actually really soon, Uh, and I wanted to let you know we're doing things a little different this year, so Sunday morning is going to stay the same. We're going to do a 9 and 11 uh, worship experience, but we we don't have room, Uh, so we are going to actually do a Thursday evening Easter worship experience. Uh, I'll be at 6.30 in the evening. A um, little different, and we, we always like to do things a little bit differently, so, um, but I want you to know it'll be the same as the other ones. It's not going to be a different thing. It's not like a different, like a Wednesday night service or a, a Good Friday, anything. It's going to be exactly the same as Sunday. It's just a different time uh, for people to be able to come, uh, so get one of these on the way out, and we will, can't believe it is already Easter. Is this the middle? I always feel like... We have this conversation every week. Look at that. See, we're the whole sermon. You guys wouldn't have got as much out of that if I hadn't done that. So we're good now. All right. Hey, uh, we are in the story of Nehemiah. So if you're, it's your first second time here, we've been going through uh, this story about this guy named Nehemiah. But we're going to get to that in a minute. I want to start with a different Bible story. So if you grew up in church, you're very familiar with the story of uh, the city of Jericho, right? The Israelites show up into the promised land. The first thing they do is they hit this city called Jericho. And it's a crazy story. Um, the, they take the city without firing a shot. Uh, they just walk around it and the walls come crashing down. It's a great thing. Um, God does this amazing work in this city. Uh, we talk about it a lot. There's songs that we sing about walls getting torn down and God doing this amazing thing. But did you know that the very next battle that Israel has after that one, they lose? They, they, and, and it's to a city that doesn't have walls. <laughs> they, they lose the next battle uh, when they were the, the favorite, and they, they lose. And the reason they lose is because they had uh, a spiritual problem that caused them to lose a physical battle. And I think that there's a, a deep lesson there, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, but what I want to look at is, so they, they get right with God. They, they fix the, phys- the spiritual problem. They go back, and they want to fight this city again. The city's called Ai. And I want to look at their battle tactics here in this fight. So um, they already lost once to this town. So the night before the battle, they send 30,000 troops around to the back of the city, sneaking, and they hide. And then when morning comes, the main army comes to the front. Now AI sees the main army, and they go, we just beat these guys. Let's go do it again. So Ai sends their army out the front gate to fight the Israelites again. And Israel, you know, kind of slowly backing up as Ai comes out and Israel starts running and Ai feels like, all right, we got them again. So, so Ai's army is chasing down the Israelites and when they get far enough away from the city that they're supposed to be defending, uh, Joshua, who's the leader of Israel, you know, sends up a signal and the 30,000 troops who were uh, hiding come out and they take the city unopposed. It's an interesting battle tactic. Now, if you're AI at that point, you got to think, that's a, that's a really frustrating thing, right? Um, they got so concentrated on, on winning this thing over here and they got so sucked into it that they, they left the very reason they were fighting. Right? They, they got so uh, concentrated on this battle over here that they, they left their post. And the very reason they were fighting falls. Um, now, think about that. AI did not lose that battle because they didn't try hard enough. They tried. 
They didn't lose that battle because they didn't run fast enough. They were plenty fast. They didn't even lose the battle because they weren't like, good, uh, having a good fight. They, they were like winning. They lost because that, they got pulled away from the thing they were supposed to be defending. Now, in military tactic, they call this a feint or a distraction, right? You, you get your enemy sucked into, uh, focused on one thing, but the real thing you're doing is actually somewhere else, a distraction. I wonder if this isn't your problem in life, if I may. It's not that you don't try hard enough, you try, and you know that, man, you, you try. It's not that you're not running fast enough, you run fast. It's not that you're not good at fighting the battles that you fight in your life, you're, you're, you're fine at that. Maybe the reason you're losing in life is because you're allowing yourself to be pulled away from what matters most. You're winning a battle, but you're losing <laughs> the war. You're distracted. This is kind of, if you were here last week, it's kind of like part two, because last week we saw um, that there was some opposition to what Nehemiah was doing, and uh, they, wanted, they wanted to destroy them, but since they couldn't destroy them, now we're going to see that the battle tactics change, and I want you to know that you have an enemy in your life, you have a spiritual enemy in your life, and Satan, for you, if he can't destroy you, he is going to try and distract you. If he can't destroy you, he's going to try and distract you. If he can't outright beat you, he's just going to try and pull you away from the things that are most important in your life. And that's what we're seeing here in the story of Nehemiah. So quick, real quick recap. Nehemiah is this guy who, who is called by God to rebuild this wall around the city of Jerusalem. And things have been going actually really awesome. Uh, he, God's been providing. The people have been getting behind him. And the work is getting done. There's been some opposition. There's some people that didn't want this wall to be built. Uh, and they came and they started with, you know, the insults and discouragement. They tried, to, they tried to beat them down that way. Then they threatened to come and actually fight them. There's a lot of different tactics. And this is what we're going to pick up in the story. The, the, the opposition has come uh, so far unsuccessfully, but they're about to change tactics. And that's what we're going to see in Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Sanballat, Tobiah... Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and, and, and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me, asking them to meet them in one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. All right, so the wall's like really close to being done. Actually, the wall itself is done. They just haven't put the gates on. Now, obviously, you know, it's kind of a big deal. You've got to have the gates on. Um, that's probably one of the harder parts of it, right? Building a wall is one thing. Hanging gates is another thing. If I hung the gates, they would just slowly close. Um, has anybody ever hung a door before? I have one in my basement that just it, it's automatic close. Uh, that's my, I, I'm, I'm that skilled that if you want me to put a door in your house, it will close automatically just slowly um, because I don't have a level, evidently. Um, <laughs> but they haven't put the gates on yet. So the enemies know he's like in the home stretch. He's right there. It's almost done. The thing is, is almost complete. The whole function of this wall with the gates, it's, it's right there. So the enemy still wants to stop him. No insults this time, no discouragement this time, no threats this time. They just want to talk. They just want to talk. Hey, we want to, we want to meet. By the way, pro tip, you look at this. Like, if you have enemies in your life and they ever offer to meet you somewhere that's called, oh no, <laughs> don't, don't go. Uh, it's like a horror movie. Should I go down into the basement and check what that noise was? No, this is a terrible idea. They're basically telling you what's going to happen. Uh, so, on the surface, though, it's just a meeting, right? Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, I think if Nehemiah gets this, like, hey, we want to meet with you, I bet you when he got that request that there were some people in his inner circle who probably said, you should do that. You should go talk to him, right? Because it's just, it's just a meeting. It's just a meeting. Now, he's, he's got some instincts. He, he knows that their motives aren't, aren't pure in this. Uh, but it is just a meeting. So how's he going to respond? Verse 3. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? 
Is that not one of the coolest verses in the Bible ever? Some of you need to make this like your, it's a part of your email signature. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like your name, your title, and Nehemiah 6.3. And then they'll have to look it up and be like, what is that, what is that verse? And you're going to tell them that you're just way too busy to meet with them. That's what that is, right? Um, so he says, hey. And notice, he didn't say, I think you're going to try and kill me. So I'm not going to go to that meeting because I think you're actually going to literally try and kill me. He didn't say that. He told it. He's like, I'll play your little game. I'm not going to meet with you because, guys, I got something going on. God, God's called me to do this great thing. I have this calling in my life. I'm not going to stop and have a committee meeting right now. I've got way too big of a thing going on over here. That doesn't quite reach the level of my attention. So, no, I'm not coming. I'm going to keep doing what God's called me to do. Now, uh, <laughs> They don't give up. Verse 4, look at this. Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. Isn't that awesome? So they keep, they keep saying, hey, come meet with us, and he just clicks copy, paste, send. Copy, paste, send. He's not even going to spend the energy to come up with a new response. He's just saying, no, no. I'm not, you guys want me to come over here, but I'm called to do this thing. You guys want me to, to meet you over here? I, I, I have this thing going on. I'm staying over here. And what I want you to see here is that distraction is one of the greatest dangers to your God-given direction in your life. Because these guys, these guys who don't want this wall built, you know, they tried the insults, they tried the threats, they tried the violent thing, and now they've come to the last thing they've got left in their little tool belt. We're just going to try and pull them away from what he's doing. We're just going to try and bog him down in something useless, get him all caught up in all of these meetings and all of this stuff so that he doesn't have time to do this. And what they really want to do is they want uh, to get Nehemiah to spend his best energy on something that's not the most important thing. That's what they're trying to get him to do. Because, I mean, think about it. Nehemiah, we talked about this, like, he's a cupbearer. This isn't his thing. It's probably taking an enormous amount of energy for him to build a wall and organize all this stuff and, and, and hang the gates and all these things. So he is taking the best of Nehemiah to do the thing that God's called him to do. But what they want to do is they want to pull the best of Nehemiah and put it over here so all he's got left is the scraps to give to his God-given calling. And that's my least favorite part of distractions is the energy cost. High cost for a distraction and a low payoff. That's what Satan wants to do with you. He wants you to give your best energy to things that don't matter. That's what he wants. If he can't destroy you, if he can't stop, if you're going to be stubborn enough to say, you know what, I want to live the way God wants me to live. I want to do what God calls me to do in my life. If you want to stay with that, Satan's going to be like, fine. But what he's going to try to do is get you to spend your best self on things that don't matter so that all you got left for that God-given purpose is the scraps of your life. That's what he wants to do to you. And let's be honest. He's succeeding a lot. He wants you to spend the best of you on things that don't matter. If he can't destroy you, he's going to try and distract you. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to talk about three of the most common distractions that I think, they think are most prevalent today. Uh, there's this line in a, in a T.S. Eliot poem, uh, distracted from distraction by distraction. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? That's like, that's like the theme line for 2023, right? Distraction from distraction by distraction. We are layers deep on distraction in our life. So I want to look at three I think that are most common for us. I'm going to bring this home. Um, and these distractions, what they are, they're, they're the same as Sanballat saying, hey, come meet with me. Come meet with me out here. Just, just, just take a pause from this thing over here. I know you spend a ton of energy. Let's just come over here and meet with me. Spend the best of yourself over here so that you don't have enough left for over here. These distractions are going to prevent the wall from being finished. They're going to slow the wall down. Sanballat doesn't have to beat you. He doesn't have to stop you. He just wants to distract you so that the wall won't go up. So, three things. Uh, you ready? All right. 
You sure? It's always scary. So it's easier for me to preach like high level ideas where you don't take it down to the ground because then you have to apply it, right? If I say, hey, Satan doesn't want to destroy you, he wants to distract you, you have to decide what the distractions are. The moment I start speaking them out, then is where you could possibly be offended. Um, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to land here, all right? So here's the first one. Here's the first one. Um, and I want to call it the first distraction, the first attempt to get you away from the thing that God's calling you to do, we're going to call it mopping the ocean. Mopping the ocean. You ever seen that? It's like a, I don't know, a reel or a TikTok of a guy who's out on the beach, and he's got a bucket and a mop, and every time a wave comes up, he's like trying to mop that thing up and squeeze the thing out and mop that thing up and squeeze it. And every time a wave comes in, he's trying to do that. You ever seen that? It's kind of hilarious, right? He's trying to mop up the ocean. It doesn't matter how much he does it. It doesn't matter how many buckets he gets. He's never going to do anything. So another way to put this one would be the distraction is things that are outside of your control. Things that are outside of your control distract you in your life. How much time do you spend? How much energy do you spend? How much uh, emotion, emotional energy, mental energy do you spend on things that are outside of your control? Things you can't do anything about. Is it possible? Is it possible that Satan wants you to spend a ton of time on things that you can't control to keep you away from the things that you can. He wants you to spend the best energy you have on things that you can't do anything about so that you don't have the best energy for the stuff that you can do something about. Is it possible? Can I give you a specific? How about world events? Can any of you stop Vladimir Putin? Do you, can, you, can you do it? If you can, why? Or have you, what are you doing? <laughs> why haven't you, right? Can any of you deal with China? You got any influence over Beijing? No? Can any of you just pick the next president? Can you just pick him? No? You can't do any of that? I can vote. Cool, do that. So you should. It's just one day a year. Take you a couple minutes. It's for me, because half the stuff I don't even know, I have to skip it. All right. Shut up, Jason. It's better than voting for something you don't know, right? Now, so here's the thing. That actually highlights an important point. Well, how much time should you spend on world events and on politics and all that stuff. How much of your time should you spend on that? Let's be honest. There's a difference between being informed and being obsessed, right? There's a, we, we can all agree there's a line, right? You know somebody here like, that guy's obsessed, right? They just spend way too much time on it. So you know there's a line. Now let's argue over where it goes, okay? Where does the line go? Because you want to say the crazy person, but I want to say, let's move the line. Let's, let's move it this way and say, yes, stay informed, you should stay way far away from being obsessed. How much time should a person spend knowing what's going on in the world? Does, does you reading, watching, listening to the news, the talk shows, all that stuff, does it build God's kingdom? Does it? Like, there's really only, besides voting, there's really only one thing you can do, right? So you can, I, good, like, I want you to know what's going on in the world. But besides that, the only thing you can do is pray, right? That's, that's what you, that's the action step for the Christian, right? You can't do anything about these things because they're way, way bigger than you, way outside of your control. All you can do is pray. And I think you should pray. The Bible actually tells us we should pray for our leaders. We should pray for our enemies. We should do all that stuff. So pray, 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 yes. Beyond that, let me ask you this, though. Someday, when you stand before God, you know, God's up on his throne you're going to be standing here. Do you think that God's really going to say, hey, 
all that time you spent watching Fox News. Great job. That, who else would have? You know, I just needed somebody to do it, and you did it. Or, 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 hey, the emotional energy you spent hating Donald Trump. Love it. Great job. There, I hit both sides. Can we all exhale? Okay, good. Right? Is that? I don't know. I actually, maybe it's not. Or, 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 let's bring it all the way home. Hey, thank you for reading every comment on Wadsworth Neighbors. That was such well-spent time. Great job. Keep, keep, if you hadn't kept track of all that, I don't know what I would have done. Is God really going to say any of that? Because, like, I just, I wonder. I mean, if you were Satan, wouldn't you? Wouldn't this be a part of your strategy? Hey, let's get him caught up in this. Let's, let's have him spend a bunch of emotional energy, a bunch of mental energy, just angry or frustrated or disappointed or sad or depressed or whatever about things that they can't do anything about so that when they have an opportunity to do something, they're way too tired, they just don't give a crap. Wouldn't that be what you, wouldn't you do that? Because I would. So, so let's, <laughs> let's not let him scheme over here. Let's not let him get us sucked into this stuff that we can't do anything about. Yes, let's stay informed. Yes, let's pray. But then, listen, there's a, and I think you probably know this, there's, a, there's like a mental thing that you have to do, an emotional thing that you have to do when you pray about this stuff. You have to give it over to God because he is the only one who can handle this. He's the only one who can do anything about this stuff. So yes, be informed. Yes, vote. Yes, pray. Let it go. Give it to God. Give it to God. You should clap. Thank you. Thanks. Now, some of you, so is, is my wife in here? Lisa? Lisa, are you here? So the ironic, the funny joke would be that she never knows what's going on in the world at all. So I have to tell her, like, hey, did you know that there's a war right now? She wouldn't even know that. Um, even if it was probably, like, home base, she still would not know. So that's the opposite. I will say this. Some of you are like, that doesn't apply to me. That's fine. But you probably do spend emotional energy on things that you can't control. Maybe it's not politics. Maybe it's not world events. Maybe it's some kind of health thing. Maybe it's some kind of financial thing. I don't know. You, but I know that this is a tactic of Satan to get you to focus on things that you can't do anything about in order to drain you of the energy that you could be spending on things that you can do something about. So don't let him do it. Don't mop the ocean. You'll never drain it. It doesn't do anything. It's wasted motion. All right, so that's the first thing. First tactic of Satan to distract you. Here's the second one. Uh, we'll call it, it's not the ant, it's the army. It's not the ant, it's the army. Um, you ever see an ant in your house? If you're a, a homeowner? One ant is whatever, right? Who cares? It's just an ant. Little tiny thing, six legs, smush it, it's over. But you know that when you see one, it usually means there's going to be or there is more, right? And it's, so it's not the ant you're worried about, it's the army. Now, as a parent, I kind of feel like they're doing God's work in my house, okay? So there's crumbs everywhere, and I'm like, you know what, guys? Have at it. Like, this, you're more helpful than my children. So just, you know, I'll show you the path. There's, you know, under the table is where I want you to focus. Um, but here's the thing. And, and this is the essence of it, right? You know that when you see ants, they're not just going to be satisfied with the crumbs, right? They're coming for your cupboard. They're coming for your counter. They're coming for your pantry. They don't just stay on the ground. They go everywhere. That's the essence. It's not the ant. It's the army. So the other way to put this one would be things that are small, but they add up to something that's big. 168. It's a really important number for you to know. Do you know the significance of 168? Nobody responded in first service, but it could have been because they were asleep because it was early. Um, that's the number of hours in a week. Good job. Number of hours in a week. That's how many you get. You get 168. Here's the crazy part. That's how many I get. That's how many everybody gets. We all get the same. This is the great leveler of humanity. We all have the same amount of hours in a week. You have 168. LeBron James has 168. Elon Musk has 168. The guy who lives in a tent 
and this homeless has 168. We all actually have the same amount of hours in the week. We all get the same. So you can't actually say to anybody, you have more time than me. That's not true. You may have more demands on your time than someone else, but you have the same amount of time. You have the same amount. So let's do, let me do some quick math. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. Don't worry. So 168. Let's assume you have a semi-normal work situation. So 40 hours a week. That sounds like a part-time job, right? So 40, 40 hours a week, you work, that drops you down to 128, right? Let's say you spend five hours a week commuting. That drops you to 123. You can fill in the blanks if you have to change that. Let's also say, this is a funny joke, that you sleep eight hours a night. Cool? <laughs> it's cool. So that'd be 56. That drops you down to 67 hours left. Get you to and from work and a good night's sleep, and you still have left almost 10 hours a day left. That's a lot. I, mean, I have kids, it's not. I know, I know, I know, I know. But that's, that's 10 hours. 10 hours that are unspoken for. 10 hours that you get to decide to a certain extent what you do with it. 10 hours. Now, first time you're like, eh, it's not though, I work 47 hours and my commute's 10, whatever, whatever, do the math. Maybe it's not 10 hours, maybe it's eight a day or nine or whatever. <clears throat> what do you do with it? Can I, t can I show you the, the ant that turns into an army? It's in your pocket. You know, the average American adult Spends four hours a day on this. Now, that's not Gen Z. They're way overachievers. They're like six or seven or something like that. The, and that's the average. That's the average. I've talked to people who said that when, because you get the little notification, right, if you have an iPhone and you actually love Jesus. Um, <laughs> you guys know that if you have an Android and, it, and you're in a group text and it makes the group text green, how annoying that is for those of us who own iPhones, right? Do you know that? Thank you. So one, one person said, it is, just, just get an iPhone. Anyways, sorry. The iPhone tells you every week what your average was. Um, so let's go back to our little math. You got 10 hours. Let's, let's give me a hypothetical. I know that it isn't exactly your number, but let's just say that you have 10 hours a week that you get to decide, or 10 hours a day that you get to decide what to do with it. If you're normal, you spend 40% of them staring at this. Not all at once, right? Just one ant, just two ant, just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit here. And it adds up to 40% of the time that you could spend doing whatever you want. You spend it here. Now again, if I'm Satan, I'm leveraging that as hard as I can. I'm getting you sucked all the way into this. I'm pulling you in minute by minute, reel by reel, tick-tock by tick-tock, candy crushed by candy crushed. I'm pulling you in every minute I can get onto here. Because I know if you're doing this, if you're spending time here, you're not doing what you're called to do. So I'm going to pull you in as much as I can. As much as I can. I feel like <laughs> this is like the battle of our day. Can we be honest? It's kind of lame. Like when we get up into heaven, you know, you're going to get up there and you're going to talk to Paul. And Paul's going to talk, man, yeah, man, being on earth was tough. There's so many temptations. You're like, yeah, man, temptation. Look at what was yours. I was staring at it like a four-inch box. Paul's going to be like, that's lame. But you know what? Can we just be real? This is our time. This is what we live in. And we can say that they were all more spiritual, but this is a huge temptation. This is, this is real. We can say it's lame, it's still real. We get sucked into this. Four hours a day. And again, you can customize this. If you have an iPhone, you just got the notification this morning of what your weekly average was, right? How depressing was that? Let me give you some other numbers. You know the average novel? takes 700 hours to write, the average novel. So, if you took one of your hours off of here, 
and wrote, you could write a novel in two years. If you went crazy and said, you know what, I'm going to drop down two hours, you could knock a novel out in a year. I know some of you are like, no, I couldn't. And you're right, you couldn't. But somebody <laughs> hypothetically could. What about this? If, you, if you'd knocked an hour down and spent an hour walking, you know you'd burn enough calories to lose 30 pounds in a year? Just knock an hour off of this thing. If you just took 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and read your Bible, you could read the Bible in a year. For some of you faster readers, you could probably do it twice. See, it's the little things that add up to the big things. It's not the ant, it's the army. And here's what this does for me, besides making me feel like crap. Um... Because I'm here too. I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to us. This is my problem too. What this does for me is it prevents me from saying, you know what? I don't have time. Every week when I get that reminder that says how much time I spent on this phone, it prevents me from being able to say I didn't have time. It prevents me. Because I know. I know it's true. It's not lying to me. I can't say that. How much of the thing that God's actually called you to do could be spent you, you, your, your energy and your time could be spent here instead of there. Don't let, don't let the ants win. Don't let... This, this, isn't it crazy that once you kind of unmask Satan and his tactics, you just feel so stupid for letting him use it? Like, yeah, he's, he's got us running out chasing the army when he's been camped out behind the city the whole time and he's just gonna, he's just gonna burn it to the ground while we're out doing something that doesn't even matter. I don't want to let him win. I don't want to let him win. I don't want to leave the most important thing to go do something else. So that's the second thing. Don't mop the ocean. <laughs> it's, the, it's the army, not the ant that you got to worry about. And then the last one, the last distraction. Uh, things that are good. Things that are good. Good things are the most dangerous distractions. And the reason good things are the most dangerous distractions is because good things are the leading competitor against great things, against the best thing. They are. And here's how I know. Like, you as an adult, wouldn't it be awesome to be able to choose between good and bad as an adult? We don't get that very often anymore, right? When you were a kid, it was like, okay, is this good or bad? And you had to choose. And you, like, you knew the right answer. You just struggled to actually take the right answer. But as adults, most of the time, we don't get good versus bad, right? We get good versus good versus good versus kind of good versus better versus I can't tell, right? Most of our decisions are between good and maybe a little bit better. It makes it difficult, right? Because you as a parent, you've never, you've never had uh, a conversation that was like, should we sign our kid up for soccer or uh, murdering class? You know, like which... You know, week three, interesting strangling technique there, you know. Like, that's not a conversation you have, right? It's between good and good. It's between this or that. That could also, you know, this could be a good thing, this could be a good thing, this could be a good thing. Which good thing should we choose? Good is the leading competitor against great. The easiest way to get distracted in your life is to settle for good things when God is calling you to great things. That's the easiest way. That's what Satan wants, right? If God's calling you to great, Satan wants to throw good at you nonstop. Satan's going to have good opportunities rain from the heavens down in your face. As many as he can get for you to come over here into the land of distraction to keep you away from the thing that God has called you to. He's going he's gonna to pile it on. So here is the solution. Are you ready? You have to tap into the spirit of two-year-old you and remember a word that you learned in your twos when you were two. You were good at this word. You were the best at this word. You threw this a word around. It might have been the only word you knew, but you need to remember it. You ready? Do you know? Do you remember? How many of you have a two-year-old and you know the word? The word. It's just two letters. It's the word no. You just need to remember that. You were good at it. You were at one point in your life. You were really good at saying no. You need to get back to that. Some of you don't have that word in your vocabulary anymore. But listen, you can't say yes to every paper your kid brings home from school. You can't. 
I actually think it's physically impossible because there would be more time. It's actually more than 168 hours worth of things that you get <laughs> when, when your kid brings home papers. But you can't, and you shouldn't. You can't say yes to every sport your kid wants to play. You can't say yes to every invitation that you get. You can't say yes to every phone call, every text, every message you get. You can't say yes to everything. You can't. You have to decide. So this is the thing. You have to go uh, have like a meeting before the meeting. You have to decide. You have to sit down with God and say, hey, God, what actually is best? What is the thing that you are calling me to do? What is the center of the bullseye in my life? So that when the good opportunities come across the table, I can actually be able to make the decision of what is the thing that you want me to do versus what is the thing that Satan's throwing in my face to try and get me away from the thing that you want me to do. Open up your calendar in the presence of God. You ever pray over your calendar? My calendar is my prayer list. I don't know if you guys do that. That's like Monday morning when I wake up, it's like open up the calendar. I'm praying through the things that are on it. Pray about it before you put it on it. See, here's the thing. And I, anticipating a mental pushback. I think a lot of people that I run into have this attitude. Maybe it's not you, but I, ha I, I feel like I get this attitude like stuff's dictated to you. Like, almost like people, the feel is like you're writing your life instead of, or you're reading your life instead of writing it. Like it's, it's, it's dictated to you. You don't actually have the pen in your hand. Somebody else has a pen in their hand. They're writing it. You're just reading it. And you kind of have that attitude. Like I can't do anything about this stuff. It just is. And, and wherever life floats me is where I am, and it's just kind of what it, it's just what it is for me. What if you took the pen back? What if you had the attitude that you could actually make some choices? Well, we have to. No, you don't. Who said? You're allowed to buck some social norms. You don't have to say yes. You don't have to, you, don't have to, you certainly don't have to say yes to your kids. <laughs> yeah, but they fight. Yeah, I know, don't they? I'm immune to it now. I have four kids. I say no, they fight. All I hear is wah, 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 wah. I just keep saying no. And pick the right things to say yes to. It's not easy. I mean, me and my wife have to be on the same page with that stuff. I'd rather do that. I'd rather fight the good fights. I'd rather say no to all the good things in order to say yes to the best things. Because I know that that's, what God wants, that's the way God wants me to structure my life. So I have to fight for it. It's an upstream battle. But I'd rather dictate that. I'd rather make the choices than just end up somewhere in my life and be like, how did I get here? Oh, it's because I just said yes to whatever. A bunch of good things. And missed the best thing. That one's not easy. So, what The, the question, the question that pops up immediately with this, so I'm just going to keep reminding you of this, this is going to be, hopefully, we just keep tilling this into the soil uh, this year as we go. Satan wants you to live a life of mundane mediocrity. Most of us aren't going to end up in the gutter somewhere, right? Probably. You're not steering away from that. It's not like a big risk in your life. He wants, Satan wants you to spend enormous amounts of time on temporary things. And if Satan can get you to do that, he wins. You're out in somewhere meeting with Sanballat instead of rebuilding the wall. That's what Satan wants. It's not a bad thing. It's just not the thing. It's not the most important thing. It's not the thing that God's called you. It's not the thing God's created you for. That's what Satan wants. That's Satan's win. So you know his game now. I don't think he's out. I, most of you, he knows he's not going to outright destroy you. He's just trying to distract you now. So, let, remind, let me remind you. Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. That, those two are the most important verses for you as a Christian because those are the verses that... that tell us what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who is saved by grace through faith. You're a Christian, not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did. And you can never forget that. 
And you need those first two verses before you can even begin to understand the second one. You need to understand that Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sins. And that gives you your right standing with God and your future home in heaven. That is the most important thing for you, is your faith in him. Now, but that's, <laughs> that's as far as some Christians go. Like, All right, Jesus died for me, awesome. But the, the verse 10 is the one that, that builds on that and shows us something I think even crazier, deeper, deeper. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. He didn't just save you and then say, okay, cool, they're gonna, I'll see you in heaven, bye. Have fun with the next couple of decades, whatever, I'll see you then. That's not, that's not what he did. He saved you and now he's enacting this plan. And this says that he had from long ago, before you were born, before the world was created, he thought about you, he had a plan for you, he had a purpose for you. That's crazy. I want you to know that. Not here, here, Christian. I was talking to my small group about that. Was it this week or last week? We talked about, like, I want, for everybody who goes to this church, I want you to have the sense that when you walk into a room, that God has you there for a reason. That there's a, like you have a sense of purpose, a sense of destiny when you walk in there that God had a reason for you to be there. That in eternity past, God thought about you, he thought about the situation and he put you there and he had a reason for it. How crazy would that be for you to live your life like that? That you don't just randomly walk into a place, that you know that God has you there for a reason. That he's going to do something with you there that doesn't just matter in the temporal, but it ripples into eternity. Man, what kind of life would you live if you felt that way? in every place you went, that God's got an eternal purpose for me here. I'm not gonna let all this junk distract me because God's got me here for a reason. I don't wanna live in that. See, I think a lot, a lot of our distractions would be solved if we really believed that. That the real fight is that when you read verse 10 and it says, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago that somehow you like exclude yourself from that. That you don't think that God thought about you in eternity past. That you don't think that he has like a destiny for you. That you're str you still think it's like a question, but it's not, it's not. He really does have a plan for you. He really does have a purpose for you. And I know, you're like, but what is it? Okay, can we get to that in a minute? I just wanna live in the, he does have one though. Just because you don't know it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Stop fighting that because you don't know it. You're using not knowing it as some excuse to say, maybe I'm the exception here. You're not. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Every room you walk into, he's got you there for a reason. He does. I feel like if you believed that, the distractions would be a whole lot easier to fight because it's a lack of purpose. Why not stare at my phone and I don't have anything else to do? Yeah, you do. Get back to the wall. He's got, he's got something big for you. Big for you. Look at this. Let's, I got to round out the story here. Nehemiah 6, uh, verse 15 and 16. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. The only way that happened was for them to say yes to great things and no to other things, good things or otherwise. They had to fight the distractions and stay focused on what God had called them to. And that's the life I want you to live. A life that, that ripples into eternity. We don't let Satan win with these distractions. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray for the person right now who is still struggling to believe Ephesians 2 verse 10, that they are your masterpiece and that you thought about them in eternity past and you have a plan and a purpose for them. Lord, I pray that that would burrow down into their soul, that that truth would stick to them. 
that it would ignite something inside of them. They're not just meant to float through life. They're not just meant to go from distraction to distraction to distraction. That you want to do something that ripples into eternity through them. Lord, and I pray for those of us who do know that, but we're letting Satan kick our butts. That we're mopping up the ocean. That we're, we're letting... We're letting the ants come in and form an army in our lives, Lord, that we're, we're saying yes to a bunch of good things and we're missing the great thing. Help us to lean in to your purpose, Lord. And I pray for the per- person who's sitting there saying, I don't know my purpose. I pray that you'd start to guide them, that they'd say yes to you before they even know what it is. You'd steer them, guide their next step towards that. Help us to be a church full of people who live a life of purpose. We want to see what you can do, Lord. In Jesus' name.